Florida, good morning and welcome to Waterfront Community Church this morning for our worship and those of you joining us online, welcome. And if you're here this morning and you're a visitor or you're a student that has just uh, moved to study in Swansea, then we give you a good Welsh Swansea welcome, Croeso. I know we've got some from someone from Canada and from California with us this morning uh, they moved to study in Swansea so all you students that have joined us or come back for your second third or fourth year let's give him a good Swansea welcome welcome bless you <laughs> we are not a perfect church but we are a bunch of forgiving forgiven people and we rejoice constantly in the grace of God as a church here, we are a Pentecostal church, so we believe that God still speaks today, and uh, we're going to hear something from God now as Keith comes and shares something that he believes he's received from God for us this morning before we sing our opening song. So let's just settle our hearts. I would ask you this morning before you came to this place what were your expectations of today what were your expectations of this meeting you come expecting to meet me for I am a God that will meet you at the level of your expectations do you not know do you not realize that throughout the world there's been meetings already where I've met people. I have healed people. Not only from mental, emotional, but also in the physical. I can touch them where their expectations are. In fact, I go over and above the expectations. I'm asking you today, Take off your masks. Open your minds. Open your hearts to what I have for you. Just raise your expectations in me, and I will meet you, says you, Lord. Thank you, Keith. And let's receive that as something that God wants to challenge us with this morning, because the Bible does tell us that as we draw near to God, He draws near to us. And He's a God who meets us at the point of our need. So let's be open to Him as we worship, as we listen to the reading of Scripture, the prayer, as we share communion together around the Lord's Supper, as we hear the Word of God being preached. Let's be open to have an encounter this morning with a living God. Let's stand and sing our opening song. The group will lead us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And thank God this morning for grace, because I'm only here by the grace of God alone. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Got a full house today. I um, hope you guys are all doing well. It's nice to be back leading worship and worshiping God with you all. Um, so let's sing. Um, yeah, this is Amazing Grace.
Amen. Let's remain standing as we commit this service to God in prayer. Liz is going to come and pray with us, ask God's blessing on our gathering, especially on the preaching of God's word. Thank you, Liz. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning that we are here in your house, in your kingdom, in the place where your glory dwells, in the place where we are friends one with the other. And Father, we just bring ourselves to you this morning. And we ask that, Lord, as you have spoken already, that we will expect the unexpected. We expect miracles within our lives this morning, that you will touch us right at the point of our need. Lord, for the word that is going to come to us, we pray, oh God, your anointing upon it, that it will set the captive free. It will open the eyes of the blind. Lord, that you will anoint the hearer. You will anoint the speaker. And Lord, those among us who have needs, we pray, oh God, that you will meet people right at the point of their need. Lord, for those who are sick, Lord, that you are the healer. For Lord, for those who feel that they're in prison, you are the chain breaker. Lord, we thank you that you are almighty God and we can expect great things. Father, open our hearts that we can accept and receive your word and all that you have for us this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Liz. Let's take our seats. We're going to hear the word of God read to us now and Nathan's going to come and read to us. Thanks, Nathan. The reading is today um, taken from the book of Haggai, the first six verses of chapter one. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealti, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. This people says, the time has not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Amen. Thanks, Nathan. Can I just give you uh, one or two announcements? Uh, we'll try and keep them brief. And can I ask if you have any announcements that you try and get hold of Rian uh, either by phone or by email to have them in the, in the newsletter so that we don't take too much time with announcements because sometimes the announcements can be longer than the sermon. Just a few announcements this morning. Just remind you that tomorrow evening is our prayer meeting. That's 7.30 till 8.30 here at the church. Prayer meeting tomorrow evening. Uh, then I've been re asked to remind you that on the 16th will be the men's fellowship at 6 o'clock here. And it's a chat and prayer. So that's the 16th uh, for the men. And can I also remind you that on the 22nd, Sunday the 20, is it 22nd or 23rd? I can't remember now, whichever one of those is a Sunday. Uh, we've got Renewed Faith, the group from Ireland here at 5 o'clock singing. So there will be a concert here, a service here, an evening service, 5 o'clock on Sunday the, Sunday the 23rd. Okay, so Pastor Mark Davis is coming back and he'll be preaching in the, in the morning with us and then there'll be that concert in the evening. And uh, Pastor Warren wants to thank uh, all those who helped at the Seniors Convention in Penagros yesterday. Also been asked to announce an autumn social walk around the marina, 2 p.m. on Saturday the 15th, followed by a bring and share afternoon tea and all are welcome to join that. Then there's a few calendars left. They are in short supply now. They're going quick. If you want to buy a church calendar, £7.50. And if you see Keith at the end of the service, a wonderful pictures of Swansea and the surrounding areas. Now Megan has one final announcement for us. Thanks, Megan. Good morning. 
Um, it is wonderful to see so many new uh, students here. Um, so just to let you know, if you're a new student, or if you're in the young adults taxpaying bracket, um, you can stay after church. We're going to have lunch together. We've got some very generous members of the church who cook lunch for us, and we'll have a time of fellowship and uh, hanging out together. Um, we also have uh, some Sunday Culture magazines. If you're like, what? Who is Sunday Culture? That's us that stay behind for lunch. Who are they? And um, We've got a load of these left, so do flick through. They are three pounds to buy. So church members, um, and if you've written in it as well, by the way, please make sure you get your copies because we're going to give the, the, the rest of them out for free for those who are interested. Um, Finally, church, you'll notice that um, out there looks different today. There's a load of tables with pictures and things. What's going on there? Um, we have a ministries fair today. So after the service, if you get your teas and your coffees, please go and visit all of the different tables. And it's just an opportunity to see what things the church has going on. And also an opportunity for you to sign up. Uh, if you're not in a house group but would be interested, see Paul at the house group table. Or if you're interested in this read, grow, learn Bible thing that was announced last week, there's a table for that as well. Um, the same for other things, including worship zumba and um, bowls will also be advertised there. Anyway, so that's the ministry's fair afterwards. Um, can I, for those of you leading the table, if you could leave in the last hymn to get ready to your table, um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks. And there is uh, tea and coffee after the service so we can enjoy further fellowship. If you want a, th a free, co free tea or coffee, then go to the uh, cafe hatch. But if you want to pay a pound and get one of those amazing, uh, one of Billy's proper coffees, then and th that money goes to support Billy's ministry. So you can avail yourself to one of those uh, in the cafe fair. And not the cafe fair, the ministry fair afterwards. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion. One of the things we do twice a month here is to gather together around the Lord's Supper. We believe in the centrality of the cross, and we remind ourselves of what the Lord has done for us. So we're going to share communion together. We're going to listen to, to a, a song, and then we'll share in communion. Thank you, Chris.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are aware that we are a forgetful people. But we have reminded in that song this morning, lest I forget thine agony, lead me to Calvary. And our prayer is very simple this morning, that as we gather in fellowship around the Lord's Supper, that the bread and the wine would remind us once again of what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to take away our sin. And so be near to us as we share fellowship in communion this morning. For Jesus' sake. Amen. It was the Apostle Paul who said, For I have received from the Lord that which also I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we invite all this morning who know the Lord to join with us in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And ask those who've been asked to distribute the emblems if they'll come forward and we'll retain the, the wine and the bread. And we, once we have all received, we will eat and drink together as one family. As everyone who wishes to receive communion received, if not, if you'll raise your hand. Great. Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let's eat together as a family. After supper, our blessed Redeemer took the cup, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. And then he said, Everyone, 
drink of this. Let's drink together. Thank you, Father, for this privilege once more and yet once less to partake of the Lord's Supper until you come. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. As the servers are collecting the empty cups, we're going to stand and sing a hymn together uh, before the throne of God above after which Andrew will share God's word with us and we'll take up the morning offering as we are singing this hymn together. So if the group will come and lead us in this hymn before the throne of God above. is okay that's good that's good um, if you're analog like me please uh, turn to Haggai um, if you're digital or have a tablet best take it now um, this morning we're digging into to the book of Haggai now this isn't a test it's not a name I've made up I assure you it's in there it really really is buried deep into your Old Testament um, it'd probably be the um, the book that's nice and clean no highlighting no no pen scribbles no dog ears 
Um, it's uh, referred to as one of the minor prophets, and it's probably in the middle-ish, depending on what sort of Bible you have. Um, I want to give you a little bit of backstory before we jump in. Haggai is a small book, so this is not going to be very long at all. Um, it was written around 2,600 years ago. It's got only two chapters and a total of 38 verses. That's it. Um, painting in fairly broad strokes here, but Israel around 586 BC was already a divided kingdom, so it split. Um, the southern portion of Israel, it's already been conquered by the Assyrians. They took care of that about 100 years ago before we find ourselves in the events that we read in Haggai. The northern kingdom, which was the only part of Israel that was left, effectively, uh, was then conquered by the Babylonians. So the nation of Israel, it had fallen into idolatry, and they had ceased to worship God. And God had promised that if they did this, they would end up being enslaved, and that's exactly what happened. Good times. Peachy, peachy place to start a Sunday morning service. But the Babylonians, they came in, they captured the northern kingdom, and they hauled the people off around 900 or so miles away, and they kept them there for around the next, say, 50 years or so. So the northern kingdom, it gets shuffled, and um, they're under Babylonian rule, and they can no longer freely worship their God as they once did in Jerusalem. And the temple that Solomon had built, in all of its splendor, was burned down, and it was just lying in rubble. And the nation were held captive. So we fast forward 50 years, and God intercedes. Enough is enough. In 539 BC, the Persians, they come in and they displace the Babylonians. They knock those off. So they are now in charge of this captive Israel. But the difference is that the Persians, they're a little bit more liberal. They're a little bit more tolerant to a plurality of worship. And Cyrus, the king of Persia at the time, he issues a decree that all Jews can go back. They're told they can pack up and leave if they want to. And around 50,000 Jews take up that offer. They make the 900-mile journey back to Jerusalem. There were, however, um, a large portion who stayed. They felt that you know, we're doing fine. We've been here for 50 years. This is home for us now. The Persians aren't that bad, so we can, we can stay. And you can read about them in the book of Esther. But what of the 50,000 who went back? Well, once they're back, they rebuild three different things. Uh, both the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, they focus on the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah, he focuses on the rebuilding of the city and the walls that border the city. And then the book of Ezra, that focuses on the rebuilding of the people. So you've got the temple, the city, and the people all being rebuilt from different angles. And particularly in the book of Haggai, God is going to speak to these people because as soon as they arrive in 536 BC, uh, they begin to rebuild the temple. And they get the foundation bit done, and in about that same time, the Samaritans, they begin to persecute them. Uh, they are basically writing letters to Persia, and they're saying, look, listen, you do not want to let these people do this. If you allow them to rebuild this temple, they're going to start worshipping their God, and they believe their God is the only God, and the moment you allow them to do that, anarchy is going to ensue. They're going to rebel against you, defy your leadership, you're going to have a mess and a lot of trouble on your hands. So if you're not going to stop them, we'll do it. And these threats, they scare this 50,000 person remnant that came back. So once they get the foundation poured, they're done. They quit. And they take off and they begin focusing on their own homes. And this goes on for around 15 years. So after 15 years, the temple is still lying in ruins. There's a foundation, but there's rubble everywhere. So God's temple has not been restored. The people had been redeemed and released only to go back and focus on themselves. So God sends the prophet Haggai. He comes in to speak to the nation of Israel. And starting in chapter 1, verse 1, you get details, lots of details. Now, for most books in the Bible, we have approximates. We know they were written roughly about this time or that time. Uh, we know they were written collectively over a 1,500-year period. We can pinpoint most of the 66 books as to when they were written, but none is like Haggai in its explicit detail. We know exactly what day and what year these prophetic messages occurred. So he starts, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, in the second year of Darius the king. So Cyrus has gone. Um, and his son Darius, he's now taken over as the ruler of Persia. Uh, in the second year 
of Darius the king in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, which basically means this is August 29th, 520 BC. We know exactly when this took place. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai to the prophet Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Now, Zerubbabel, he is um, the owner of a fantastically difficult name, um, but he is the political leader of the nation. And when they were captured by the Babylonians uh, 50 years earlier, Zerubbabel, he was effectively, he was next in line to be king of Israel. Had they not been captured, he'd have been king. Um, but instead, he went into captivity. But now he's back. He can't be king. He can't take up that mantle because Persia is now ruling. So he gets to be a governor. A quick side point, if you look at the book of Matthew in chapter 1, and it spans verses 12 and 13, it's the genealogy of Jesus. The Zerubbabel that's mentioned there is this guy. And there's also uh, Joshua, uh, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And Joshua is the spiritual leader. He's the high priest that shepherds the nation. Um, he's the intercessor between the people and God. And these are the people to whom the, the word of the Lord comes to in verse 2. And what you have in verse 2 is God's perspective on the excuse that the people were offering as to why they could not be building God's temple right now and why they've sat for 15 years doing very little other than concentrating on themselves despite God having called them to rebuild his temple. And this is their excuse. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. That's their excuse. And this is interesting because what does God call his beloved nation? He doesn't call them my people. He says, these people, these people say the time has not yet come. And see, that's a tip off. That's a tip off you've done something wrong when he doesn't refer to you as your own. God says, these people, this is their excuse for why they have not touched my temple in 15 years because they say the time has not yet come. So the book of Ezra tells us about this Samaritan persecution where the Samaritans, they got upset, were pleading with Persia not to let them do this, making threats. And as a consequence, the people became afraid. They felt that this persecution was so tough, it was so uphill, that, you know, there's no way God can mean for us to be doing this. There's just too much resistance. It's just basically God's way of telling them to, you know, take a little me time. But 15 years of me time is a little bit excessive. So God wants to confront this. Uh, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. And notice what he says to them. You can, you can draw a circle around the word time in verse 2 and a circle around the word time in verse 4, and you can connect them because this is basically God's derision to this excuse. He says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, lies in ruin? Now, God is basically saying, so let me get this straight. So you say the time hasn't come and it's too hard and it's too difficult and you can't commit to my work, but you do evidently feel that it's time for you to focus on your own home. The word that jumps out in this passage that gives context to the rest of this book is a word in verse 4. In a word, excuse me, is a word in verse 4. It's the word paneled. Now, if you were a Jewish reader, this would have caught you completely off guard. So the idea of a paneled house means it's just simply wood cladding, wood paneling, where you would take, in this instance, it would be cedar wood, and you use it to statement finish your home. In this, context, in this context, that's the ultimate embellishment. Israel is not renowned for its rolling forest woodlands. They're not a massive woodworking community. And an interesting side point that some scholars believe that Jesus wasn't just a woodworking carpenter, because the word to describe his trade, tecton, actually means stone builder. Anyway, in Israel, the community is stone buildings, and it's mandated law to this day that any new building that's built in Jerusalem has to be made out of the native white sandstone rock. So in order to get wood to panel your house, you would have had to have gone miles into a place called Phoenicia, which is effectively modern-day Lebanon, spending a great deal of time, effort, to cut down these trees, to fashion them, and then bring them back, and then panel your house with them. So here, the Lord's point is this. He says, you're telling me that it's time to focus on your own house and not mine. So you're prepared to spend a ton of energy 
resources and time going to a foreign land, doing all this laborious work to bring back this material just so you can build your own house. Meanwhile, mine lies in ruins. My kingdom is an eternal kingdom, and yet you're building up your own, completely neglecting me because you've chosen to ignore it and focus on you. Something is not right with that. I just want to make a quick point here that I want to explain what the problem isn't before we jump into what it is. See, the problem is not having wealth. Okay? The problem is not owning nice things. In fact, if you go through the scriptures, the idea of wealth is talked about a lot. But truthfully, money, wealth, and resources in and of themselves are not condemned in scripture. What is condemned is the love of those things. Now, 1 Timothy, <laughs> excuse me, 1 Timothy 6.10 could be a contender for the most, mis- the most misquoted scripture that there is. Paul says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not that money is a root of all evil, it's the love of money. So the problem here is not wealth, but people want to make that the problem. We want to demonize wealth. In order to be spiritual, we need to be walking around in sackcloth and eating honey and picking locusts off trees to eat those. That's not scripture's point of view. The problem is priority, and priority is always connected to your heart. Jesus addresses this very point in Matthew 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he's saying, you can pay me lip service all the live long day. You can say that you love me, that I'm your God, that I'm your king. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't show up on where your treasure is, it'll always and only ever be lip service. See, the issue here, and what God is relaying to these people is that the problem isn't all these other things. It's that they care about themselves more than they care about God's kingdom. God is saying, I redeemed you. I brought you out of captivity. I gave you the freedom to go home. I saved you, not so that you would come back and focus on yourself, but that you would serve the very king who liberated you. In verse 5, God essentially calls a bit of a time out. And he says through Haggai, Let's do a test, all right? Let's, let's put this to the test for just a moment. Let's take these last 15 years that you've spent pouring into your own kingdom and neglecting mine, and let, let's find out in brass tax terms just how successful you've been neglecting me and pursuing you. Pick it up. It says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. He's saying you've done a lot of work in planting seeds and hoping the crops will come up and you can reap this great harvest, but nothing has come forward. It goes on. Uh, you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. Your clo- you clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. So you've got God saying to Israel, let's see what's happened for these last 15 years. It's not time for my temple, not to do the work I've asked you to do, but it is for your house, and as you've pursued you, expending a ton of energy and expecting this great return, nothing has happened. I want to jump ahead to uh, verses 9 to 11, um, because I want to explain why nothing has come forth. And it says, uh, You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. See, they had great ambitions and great wishes for life and what it would be like as they came back. But they're back and they've poured into their own lives and they've done this for 15 years and nothing has come to fruition. Even the little they did, God blew it away. So theologically, God is behind this. Why? He goes on to answer it. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. God is the reason nothing has worked out. Now, I need to be careful here because we we don't need to be straying into the erroneous doctrine that just because something bad happens, you have to be in sin. That's not true, okay? Universally, all the way through scripture. Are there times where that's true? Absolutely, this is one of them. I would argue that this is a national sin, and it took place in violation of Deuteronomy 28, which was the Mosaic Covenant. It basically said, the day that you forsake me as a nation and you turn to idols, I will withhold the rains from your crops. And that's exactly what happened here. 
So are there times when God disciplines those whom he loves? Absolutely. But it is also true, biblically, that we live in a fallen world where everything, and I mean everything is broken from Genesis 3 onwards, so disease, sickness, bad stuff, it happens. As a result, people suffer. God's promise in Deuteronomy 28 happened in verse 10. He said, therefore, the heavens above you will withhold the dew and the earth will withhold its produce. So basically, famine has taken place and God has put it there to show the nation how fruitless they would be when they neglect him and they pursue themselves. So God says in verse 11, And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what, brings, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labors. They've pursued an entirely selfish agenda. And the worst thing you can do with your life is be totally committed to it. In Mark 8, Jesus said, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their very soul? See, this encapsulates what is a very radical call of discipleship. That you and I have been saved and redeemed, but not to come back to an old life and focus on ourselves. That's not what salvation does. Salvation liberated you, not to indulge in you, but to serve the God who freed you. That's pretty much the whole point of Romans 6. And God says to his people here, give careful thought to your ways. You spent the past 15 years pouring and pursuing into yourself, and where has it led you? You're hungry, thirsty, and cold. It's not exactly going well. So what's the answer? What do you do when you're in that situation? What do you do when you find yourself in a position where whatever you try just doesn't really work out? The answer is in verse 8. So we're skipping back a little bit. And this is what God tells the nation of Israel. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may glorify it. In other words, I want you to go to the same place you used to go and supply the goods for your own kingdom. Take the same energy, get the same resources, and the same offering you took for your own life, and bring it back and pour it into my house. Stop pursuing you. What we've got here is an act of repentance. Seek first my kingdom. All the other stuff I will take care of, but seek me first. So what's the response of the people? What do they do? It's verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and uh, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of their God. Obedience settled in. They heeded the word of the Lord. But I want you to note what the first act of obedience was. They obeyed the voice of the Lord, the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. The first act of repentance has nothing to do with their hands. It had everything to do with their hearts. It's not as if they heard the message and said, right, okay, let's grab a shovel, we're off, let's go. That's not what they did. Their first act of obedience was a fear of the Lord. There was a reverence. And remember, what's, what kicked all this off was an idolatry issue. It's not wealth, it's not time, it's not discipline, it's a heart issue. Their first act of obedience was to repent from the heart. As soon as that happened, instantly, notice how God responds. The moment their heart is broken, verse 13, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. The moment your heart turns in its affections for the Lord, you instantly have the promise from God that he is with you. And then notice what happens next. Verse 14, once the heart is secure, now the hands follow. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnants of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, their God. So why would I share this with you? You could argue it's an interesting passage to use. 
do we have something as a church that we're building into? The answer is yes, but it's not a physical building. The Lord no longer dwells in a house made of human hands. It's a spiritual one. See, he has saved us and has put us on a mission to go and herald the good news of Jesus Christ, to build up his church, his people. That's the work we've been called to do. And here's the beauty of this. If you stop and listen to the story here in chapter one, it's the gospel. See if this sounds familiar, track with me through this. The nation of Israel is commanded to pursue God and there would be peace in the land. Instead, they forsake that and they start pursuing themselves. God then sends in the Babylonians to enslave them. But at the right time, he redeems them, brings them out and frees them. So not only could they return to a new life, not to pour into it themselves, but that they would go and give that new life away in serving the king who liberated them. See, that's the gospel. That's the same thing that happened to you and me. See, you and I, we rejected God, exchanged, exchanged truth for a lie. That's Romans 1. See, we were judged and enslaved to the captivity of our own sin. But at the right time, just as we've celebrated and remembered this morning, Jesus Christ's blood was offered. He was sacrificed on our behalf. Our sin on him. He took it in our place. And as a result, God, looking through the lens of Christ, now sees us as we were always intended to be. We've now been reconciled to that God through faith in Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed from captivity and we've been sent out into the world not to go and pursue a kingdom of our own, but to pursue his. That's why we're here. And God is far from finished. Far from finished. There's more to come. But if we're honest, we can very often get caught up with comparing what was to what is. And in doing so, we can often think that the best days are behind us. You know, the church is in decline, certainly the Western church. Christian principles, they're disregarded. Christ's name, that's little more than an expletive in today's society. But look at Haggai chapter 2, verses 3 to 9. Who of you is left? Who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong. For I am with you, and my spirit remains among you. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in this place, I will grant peace. See, the temple was not what it had been, but it was not yet all that it was going to be. See, we're not living in a time of national revival. I get that. And I thank God for 1859, and I thank God for 1904. But those days have been. But God says, there's even better to come. In this book, this tiny little nondescript book, just tucked away in the Old Testament, God says, Five times, give careful thought. Says it, chapter 1, verse 5, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 15, and he says it twice in chapter 2, verses eight, uh, verse 18. See, give careful thought, consider your ways. Vision starts with seeing, but visions don't work unless we do. John Stott was um, an Anglican cleric and a theologian who defined this as a deep dissatisfaction with what is and a clear grasp of what could be. It's not difficult to be deeply dissatisfied with what we see in the world, but is our response to want to make a difference? To seek first his kingdom, trusting him in the difficult call of discipleship, being obedient so when things make sense to us and when they don't, to be able to say that, God, I don't get this, but I know you've got this. To make a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, I'm not arguing for us to be poor. I'm, not, I'm just arguing for us to use the resources, the time, the treasures, and the talents that God has given us individually and as a church for his purposes, for his kingdom, for his glory. 
I'm also not saying that we shouldn't have aspirations. Just that we don't get to the top of any given ladder and find out it's leaning against the wrong wall. Purpose in life is far more important than property or possessions. Having more to live with is no substitute for having more to live for. So filling your life with things will never satisfy. It may numb the pain or the sense of emptiness for a time, but there will always be the need for the next thing, the bigger thing, the shinier thing, the latest thing. Look beyond the creation to the creator. It's only there you'll find purpose, you'll find joy, and you'll find peace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone in here today and everyone who's stuck with the message to this point online. Lord, I thank you that in your divine plans and purposes, each of us is uniquely gifted and purposed by you and for you, Father. Would you forgive us for the idols we've set up in our lives? Help us to tear them down, to take the focus off ourselves, and Father, place it back on you where we need to. Father, I pray that you would allow us to be strong and be bold, to repent in our hearts. Right here, right now, this morning, as Abby, Mags, Angus, Bo and Nathan, as they lead us in a time of worship, Father, I pray that we would listen and hear you speak to us. Warm our hearts. And Father, if if there's a response, I pray that the response comes forward. If there's a need for prayer, Father, I pray people will come forward. But Father, whatever is needed in our hearts, as we've already heard, meet us at that point. If a heart needs breaking, break it. If it needs binding, if it needs comforting, if it needs loving, Father, please, by your Spirit, would you move. Help us to give careful thought to where our priorities, our efforts, our energies are focused. Let's make you the priority, seeking first your kingdom, longing to hear your voice, Father. I pray you send your spirit, Lord, and you send it powerfully. In Jesus' good name, and for your glory, amen. 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 Thank you, Andrew, for sharing that word with us this morning, and a challenging word. Where am I? In my relationship with God. Is it all about me and mine? Or is it about him and his service? Is it, is it about things? Or is it all about Jesus? I was reminded of a quote of F.B. Mayers who said, In the lives of some, Christ is present. In others, he is more than present he is prominent. But then, said F.B. Mayers, there are those in whose lives Christ is more than present and prominent, but preeminent. And God, through Haggai, was bringing the people of Israel back to the place where God once again was preeminent. And may He be preeminent in our lives. And if you're here this morning, and maybe recently you've been following from afar, maybe like the Israelites, it's all been about me and mine and my career, my things. And you've been challenged this morning to keep the main thing the main thing, and that is Jesus. Why not, as the group comes and lead us now in a time of worship, why not, to where you are, just open your heart. Do a bit of soul searching. Humble yourself and repent. And come back to that place where Jesus is everything. And as Andrew has mentioned, if you need prayer this morning, then of course we are here. Please feel free to come forward and we'll be only too glad to pray with you. But let's stand and let's worship this great God of ours. i 
It's been good, isn't it, to be in God's house? It's been great. And uh, just, just give that extension of that invite, as we heard from Andrew and Pastor Anna this morning. If you need prayer, then there's still time, there's still opportunity at the end of the service. Please come forward. We'll still be here. love to talk to you. love to pray with you. And just if God has just put something on your heart, then don't leave this place because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God has brought you to this place to do a miraculous work in your heart. So just extend that invitation. Just remember that the opportunity is just to see the different stalls at the end, so please take time to, to do that. And uh, just pray also that you have a great week. And uh, let us just tell somebody about Jesus as we go in our daily work and to our places of uh, college, university, work, maybe just to the shops. Just when that opportunity comes, let's not be afraid. Just share Jesus with those who need it. Thank you to the group for leading us in worship this morning. It's been a good day, isn't it? It's been a good morning to be in God's house. Just going to close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity. We thank you for the door that's been opened to us this morning, Lord, to come physically into this place. But thank you, Lord, you've opened our hearts, the door of our heart, Lord, to help us to understand a little bit more about your word, Lord. We thank you for Andrew as he brought that word. Father God, I just pray that you settle it in our hearts, that, Father God, we won't go from this place wondering what, but, Lord, we'll know who and why we're here. And so, Lord, we just ask you to come with us this week, Lord, as we go to our various places of work. And, Lord, just once again, give us that opportunity. Give us that door of opportunity to speak Jesus into the lives of friends and family we come against. And so, Father God, we just ask you to dismiss us right now, Lord, through the precious name of Jesus, the one who we worship, the one who we adore, Lord, the one who has given us everything and is, in, is, is everything to us also. So now, Lord, just dismiss us, we do pray. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen.